G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel for my round four thoughts. A um, couple of points of general business. Obviously, I know there's still a game to go left in the round, guys, unfortunately, um, as life would have it. I am flying out tonight, uh, as the time you're watching this, Monday night to America for a month, um, and then off to the UK permanently. And uh, therefore, I just don't have the hours in the day to be able to get that video done if I had waited for the end of the Easter Monday game. So we're here to talk about the eight games that have taken place. So I apologize, I just won't be able to comment on the Easter Monday game. I'm hoping at this rate that I even get a chance to watch it. As you can see, slightly different set. Um, I'm just in a different part of the house because um, there is stuff everywhere at the moment. Um, we're gonna be flexible, but that's a sign of things to come on the channel. Um, the next review video that you see on this channel um, will actually be me in America. So uh, who knows, this might be a sign of things to come with me sitting down holding my mic like a dickhead instead of having it in front me. So I apologize if the lighting's not ideal, I apologize if the set doesn't look that pretty, but one thing I will unreservedly not apologize for is the body odor. Let's get into this video. So it was a pretty interesting round. Um, I say that every week, but I do feel like interesting narratives have popped up across the league um, each and every week so far, which is great because early in the season, we're still learning so much about different teams, uh, but there were some generally really good finishes and some really good results for teams in sort of must-win clashes, it has to be said. I did just get back from the Eagles game a couple of hours ago, so I'm actually going to open the video with uh, talking about that while it's still top of mind. I don't have any notes in front of me. Um, usually, I will be doing the Eagles video separately, but this week, uh, I won't have the time to, nor the capacity to, um, to do three videos. So I'm going to do the Eagles review as part of this video. And uh, we'll start off with the Eagles versus Melbourne. Um, just took place at Optus Stadium and the D's far too strong. Um, pretty much outscoring the Eagles 2-1 to one throughout the entire day and ended up doubling their score. It was a very polished and um, experienced Melbourne side um, that, that took the field, obviously. And um, we know the Eagles narrative around lots of injuries and stuff like that. So it was a very inexperienced side that took um, took the field against Melbourne. And what I will say is though that the effort and intensity in the first half um, is pretty much all you could ask for as an Eagles fan of a rebuilding side with six players under 10 games of experience. I thought they took it up to Melbourne. And I don't think Melbourne had a particularly easy day today. Uh, obviously, the scoreline reflects how much better they are and how much better they were at taking their opportunities. But I do think the Eagles, throughout that game at times, pushed Melbourne to at least fourth gear, if not fifth. In fact, at certain points of the game, I think the Eagles were actually probably slightly besting Melbourne when it comes to uh, clearances when you consider the ruck disadvantage um, of Bailey Williams versus Brody Grundy and the amazing midfielders that Melbourne have. The Eagles were taking it up to them and uh, were pretty wasteful going inside 50. And I think that was ultimately the difference between the two sides is that uh, Melbourne sort of set up defensively so that they back their defenders in to win contests and they already have their overlap going with players running free. And that was the very noticeable at the ground is that Melbourne clearly had runners all through the field. They're a fast and quick and skillful team and they punished West Coast when uh, when they got the opportunity to. And in the third and fourth quarters, um, where the Eagles started to tire a little bit and we started seeing, you know, center square combinations of Bailey Williams, Jinby, Cully, Andrew Gaff versus Grundy, Viney, Oliver, Petrarca. That was where the scoreline really started to blow out. But ultimately, I think we came up against a very, very polished and quality Melbourne side that's going to be close to the benchmark of the competition right now. And uh, I walk away from that as an Eagles fan, fairly satisfied with the results. We saw some really good performances from, you know, Tom McDonald got on the end of four goals. Petrarca was brilliant, possibly got the three votes. Um, but I'll say for the Eagles, Tim Kelly put in a massive performance, as did Andrew Gaff. Yes, they were a little bit wasteful by foot, but in terms of intensity and effort for the contest, um, yeah, walk away from that, pretty satisfied with that. And Melbourne, you know, at 11 goals to their percentage. So we'll rewind a little bit to the Easter Thursday game. Sorry, that was meant to be me rewinding myself. That wasn't funny. Uh, where Brisbane took on Collingwood at, uh, at the Gabba. And I tip Brisbane in this game, even though there were comparatively the form um, meant that you should have probably tipped Collingwood going into this game, but I had a funny feeling we'd see a really spirited Brisbane effort at home, and that's exactly what we got. So I got my tip right, and early throughout the game, it was really evident um, Cam Rayner was really eye-catching. There's a lot of bit of talk about him going into the defense this year, but he, he went forward, he took some really good, strong, contested marks, and kicked that awesome goal on the run where he burnt off a couple of Pies defenders. Uh, that 
uh, has been said all through the media lately, but I think that could be the last time we see Cam Raid as a defender. He's far too dangerous as a forward. Understandably so, uh, Collingwood went into this game without a recognized Ruckman um, due to Darcy Cameron's injury from memory, and uh, naturally the Lions feasted on the clearances and the hitouts, and Oscar McInerney had a big day in particular. He won 11 clearances as well. We saw the Lions rip open this game in the second and third terms. They actually kicked 10 goals unanswered, and if it weren't against you know Collingwood or even perhaps a Melbourne or a Sydney, um, you'd think the game was over, but naturally... We respect Collingwood so much that we expected them to come back, but Brisbane just held them at bay, and Charlie Cameron got on the end of some really good work as well, kicking six goals. He was fantastic. Despite the loss, we do see the continuation of Nick Dacos as potentially a top five player in the comp on current form uh, with 38 possessions and two goals. Again, uh, I don't know if he'll get the three Brownlow votes, but he'll certainly feature in the votes for this game. Um, statistically, one of his best performances at this level, and I think he had 76% disposal efficiency on top of that, and nearly half of his possessions were contested as well. So he is winning the ball himself um, so he just continues to impress this was a much needed win for the Lions in terms of staying you know up there with some of the better teams this year we do respect them as a uh, as an outside or even genuine contender for the flag and uh, now they sit two and two having beaten a couple of decent teams in Melbourne and Collingwood they've got their season back on track then we saw a pretty competitive uh, Good Friday tussle between North Melbourne and Carlton uh, where North Melbourne have obviously displayed some good form this year as have Carlton and uh, I kind of expected a good contest and that's exactly what we got although Carlton uh, proved to be too classy getting away by four goals in this game I think the Roos stuck pretty bravely with a more mature Carlton, I'd have to say, uh, for two and a half quarters before Carlton, in particular their talls, really started to put some distance between the two sides. North ended up kicking the last four goals of the game to sort of reduce the scoreline, make it a bit more, more respectable, but I think it was more of a, a better reflection of uh, how close these two teams were on the day. I thought it was a pretty good game of footy. The Tolls in Kerno and Mackay uh, were dominant aerially. Uh, Kerno kicked six goals, Mackay kicked four, and he had 14 marks and was really, really uh, prominent around the ground. It didn't also help that when you factor in uh, the Roos were missing Ben Mackay, their first choice key back, along with Griffin Logue, who missed this game. Um, they were a little bit undermanned, but even still, Carlton just have fantastic tools, which is a strong reason why I think they're an outside contender for this year, and I've said that since the preseason. The midfielders also chimed in with, uh, you know, Cripps had nine clearances and 29 touches. Fisher was pretty good on the outside as well. He had 28 touches, very classy um, and very very quick-minded as well. He, he really caught my eye. And uh, Mitch McGovern, unfortunately, sustained an injury in this game, but he had 29 touches, and that's kind of the story of him, with him over the last couple of years, some good form and some injury, so I'm hoping he recovers quickly. Obviously, North got LD LDU and Simpkin back into the midfield for this game um, and you know we saw the immediate difference although LDU wasn't dominant as he usually has been this year uh, in terms of clearances but he was coming up against you know Patrick Cripps amongst others uh, but the forwards in particular the medium forwards for North look very dangerous in Zerha and Stevenson I think they kicked three goals each and of course we know Harry Sheasel uh, racked up 37 touches which is ridiculous for a guy his age he's continuing to impress week by week just like Nick Dacos he's doing the exact same thing the other takeaway from this game is is that, uh, or this season in general so far with Clarkson, is he doesn't mind making the tough calls, which is not something that really shocks us. But obviously, we saw him in round one leave out Todd Goldstein against the Eagles, who, you know, didn't really have a strong ruck setup, let's be honest. Uh, and in this game, decided to sub out their, you know, their absolute midfield general in Ben Cunnington because he wasn't winning clearances. So he's not afraid to make the tough calls, which is good for a side that is looking to phase out of a rebuilding mode. Then Adelaide took on Fremantle at Adelaide Oval. And another game I'm pleased to say that it was a bit of a 50-50 call when I got my tip right. Um, Adelaide ended up winning by 39 points over Fremantle, who continued to struggle. And I'd have to say, this is the most complete performance we've seen from this Adelaide group um, in, in some time, and certainly this season. Fremantle's midfield uh, you know, was admirable. They, they won the clearances from memory. But I think it was on the outside and the spread and the run and carry, which is where Adelaide stood apart from Fremantle. And that's part of their issue, I think. The inside 50 would count was pretty even, but the way Adelaide sort of moved the ball from inside to outside of the contest and marked around the field is ultimately the difference. They were much more efficient with their inside 50s, and we know how talented their forward line is in general, particularly compared to one that is a little bit dysfunctional at Fremantle. We know Fremantle's forward half issues and their inability to kick wing scores, say for a Western Derby against us. They again only managed 10 goals and uh, yeah, got slapped by 40 points. And in reality, they were closer than that than the scoreboard would suggest, but they couldn't score to really justify any good work that they did. 
Fremantle's mids in Sarong, Brayshaw, and O'Meara were pretty admirable. I think O'Meara had something like nine clearances, but as I said before, it was the outside polish where Adelaide got a hold of this game. Jordan Dawson, the skipper, was close to best on ground. He had 27 touches and a, and a really good long-range goal, as we're so accustomed to from him. Uh, Tex Walker kicked four goals, and uh, the Smalls again, uh, Rankin and Rochelle, I think they kicked three each. Typically dangerous. It's a young and talented forward line at Adelaide, and potentially shaping up to be the best in the game. Um, but maybe not now, but certainly in the near future. So the takeaways from this game is Adelaide look fit and they look tough. And if they can play like that consistently, they will play finals. Um, obviously, we just haven't seen that consistently, understandably, from a young group. And by comparison, Fremantle certainly have their issues. They are looking a long way off the finals pace right now. Then we saw an absolute cracker of a game between Richmond and the Western Bulldogs at the MCG. This is the one where I got my tip wrong, uh, with the Bulldogs prevailing by five points in... Um, really, really wet conditions. It was quite an interesting game. There were dry periods, there were wet periods, and ultimately the Bulldogs were the better side, hanging on to win narrowly. They started fast. They kicked six goals to two in the opening quarter, and then the script flipped. Uh, Richmond kicked something like seven unanswered goals, eight to goals to two in the second half, in the second term, rather, and uh, went into halftime, something like two or three goals in front. And with the momentum and the way the game was going, you really thought Richmond were going to steamroll them. It started absolutely bucketing it down at halftime, and the game sort of descended into a wet slog. And I think the Bulldogs did much better at uh, handling these conditions and their ball use, despite the conditions was ultimately probably the difference between the two sides. In fact, after their second quarter blitz, Richmond only kicked two goals uh, late in the game in the entire second half. Someone I haven't really noted properly on this channel is Tim English for his form so far this year. He's arguably the All-Australian Ruckman right now on current form. Uh, he had 145 fantasy points, which I know is not an ideal metric, but it indicates he's winning the ball, he's getting hit outs, and I think he laid something like nine tackles in this game too. Bailey Dale's run and carry was also a big feature, and Bont led the midfield really well. I think he also laid something like 12 tackles in this game. For the Tigers, uh, in particular, Shy Bolton was dangerous. He kicked three goals, including that snap right at the end of the game, which I said at the time was something only Shy Bolton could have done in that situation and nearly got him across the line. And Dusty Martin as well showed flashes of being the player that he, he is in his prime. He kicked, uh, he kicked a couple of goals, I think, or maybe it was just one, but it was a really bloody good one. But ultimately, the dogs were too good, uh, handled the conditions better. They won the clearance battle 41 to 26. They had 16 more inside 50s, and they ultimately deserved to win this match. And another side uh, like Brisbane, I think I said, who has gotten their season back on track after a really unconvincing start. They've now beaten Brisbane. They've beaten Richmond in tough conditions. They're back. Then we moved to Marvel Stadium where St Kilda battered the Gold Coast Suns by 53 points in the end and they remain the only side with a perfect record. Four wins, zero losses, 160%. I think the last time they did that was uh, back in 2010. I think it was the year they made the grand final. Again, not the highest quality of opposition, so of course there's still some question marks on St Kilda. However, you know the way they are playing is quite impressive. You have to give them due credit. They butchered the Suns on the outside. The Suns are a pretty good team on winning the ball in the inside, but St Kilda's outside run is ultimately... Um, what won them the game. I think the Suns had 10 more clearances. Contested possessions were equal, but the Saints had an incredible plus 108 uncontested possessions, which just means as soon as the ball left the contest, that's where St Kilda went to work. So on the Gold Coast side of things, I think that is a serious issue that they need to work through, whether it be through game plan or, or perhaps the way they recruit some genuine quality outside mids to complement Miller, Anderson, and Rao. It's certainly something they've got to look at. For the Saints, uh, Ross and Crouch were pretty good through the midfield. Brad Hill was good on the outside. He kicked a couple of goals to go with 20 odd possessions. Uh, Callum Wilkie is also having a fantastic year. He was really good down back again. And uh, we saw Jack Higgins kick another five goals as well. So he's in ripping form. The Saints have some good small forward options. And then we haven't even talked about Machido Owens, who I don't know if he's rising star eligible, but if he is, I presume he will get it because this was probably his best game at the level. Upon reflection, I'm starting to think St Kilda's youth might be a little bit understated. There's, there's some really positive contributions from young guys in that side. I've talked about Owens. We know how good Marcus Windhager is. He's made quite an impression on the league already. Philip Hu as well has made an impression as a, as a high-flying forward who plays on a wing a bit as well. And Wanganin Miller, I think, has found a really good niche at halfback for him as well. So they're getting some really good contributions from young guys as well as some of their more senior players. Like I said, the Saints haven't had the toughest fixture yet, but you know they continue to impress a little bit more each week. And ultimately, almost every side has had a down game so far and St Kilda haven't. And the way they play is fairly competitive. Obviously, I think they've got some tougher opposition in round five. I think it's Collingwood. I could have that wrong off the top of my head. But from what we've seen so far, I'm starting to become increasingly convinced this side will at least play finals this year. Then we had uh, not the most controversial game, but uh, it was a stunning end to the game between Sydney and Port Adelaide, where Port Adelaide prevail by two points 
in uh, in thrilling fashion. I'm sure you've all seen the footage. Oli Florent, you know, thinks he's kicked the goal to win the game after the siren the ball's fallen short somehow because I think there must have been a big breeze. You got a feel for the bloke. But this is a significant win for the power to claim a two point victory over last year's runner up. Um, you know, when all there's been heaps of criticism on Port Adelaide, including from this channel, and rightfully so. Great round one performance. Terrible round two and three performance. They're suddenly back and, and you now look at it. Both Port Adelaide and the Sydney Swans are two wins and two losses right now. So to sit two and two right now for Port Adelaide with the fixture they've had, it's a pretty reasonable foundation for them to build off now. And I always do think it's a good sign when sides are beating really good sides. And even if they're losing to the, the shitty ones, it shows that ability and capacity to beat some better teams. I think that's a really, really good sign for their ability to potentially play finals this year. It was nice to see Jeremy Finlayson uh, kick the winning goal. He had three goals in this game. Obviously, he's going through some stuff off the field at the moment. But in general, I think the, this win showed character for Port Adelaide when that was potentially questioned over the last fortnight. They overcame an early four-goal deficit, could have buckled over, uh, but fought back to win. And that resurgence could be what lifts them for the rest of the season. Can I just say, though, as an aside, I have seen a select few, uh, but it doesn't seem like a, a real minority. It seems like a, a reasonable amount of Port fans who were disappointed to win this game because it meant Ken Hinckley was probably safe. And I think that is such a perverse way of looking at it. I understand this frustration and probably a long period of, of um, Hinckley being perceived as underachieving with the list they have. And again, I'm probably only talking to a minority of Port fans, but I think that's some poor form. For the Swan side of things, it sucks for them. Two losses in a row, and I think the result is soured even more so by Paddy McCartan's concussion. Uh, that was quite chilling to watch. Made me really uncomfortable. feel terrible for the guy. And uh, it looked kind of innocuous on the first viewing, but watching him walk off the field um, was really, really concerning. So thoughts are with him right now. Oli Florent will be remembered from this game for that moment where he thought he'd won the game. But uh, he had an outstanding game, as did Chad Warner in the midfield, and they almost got their side over the line. And the final game I'll talk about in this round review you uh, was between Essendon and GWS at Marvel Stadium. A little bit of a danger one in terms of tipping. I did tip the Dons, got this right, uh, but I had a funny feeling that uh, the Giants might just get up for this game, and it kind of speaks to the evenness of this competition as well, when you consider some of the worst sides in the comp. They're actually playing some reasonable footy right now, but anyway, the Dons got the job done by 13 points in this game, and they had to overcome some really shoddy kicking at goal. There were two goals late at quarter time, six goals and 19 at one point during the second quarter, and uh, that's where I thought maybe GWS will come over the top of them, but ultimately, they prevailed, and they finished with 11 goals, 22, and a 13-point win. That really should have been a lot more. But while I say that, it was a pretty even game in most aspects. Uh, I think it was pretty statistically even, although the Dons were able to create a few more chances, a bit more meaningful and proactive with their ball use and generated 11 more inside 50s. Um, but it's lucky that they created so much supply considering their inaccuracy. They kind of got away with one there for some poor goalkeeping. It was a sort of game where most midfielders on the field actually uh, had pretty big games. Tom Green had 34 disposals for the losers. Josh Kelly again was prominent. He had a couple of goals and 28 possessions. And uh, Lockie Whitfield had 24 as well. Stephen Keneally also had a goal and 25 touches to go with seven clearances, which was the equal most of any player on the field. And of course, they were coming up against guys like Darcy Parrish, who also won seven clearances. Zach Merritt also had a typically good game through the midfield with a goal and 28 possessions, but also the form of Mason Redmond down back and Jake Stringer, of course, getting four goals uh, to ultimately put this game to bed. How much do we take out of this game? Because GWS are considered, you know, probably a bottom two to bottom three side in the comp right now. But I do think their form belies that ranking a little bit. I think the competition's even. And the thought did cross my mind. I do think Essendon of last year might have dropped this game. So we are seeing some progression. But considering this was a danger game, I'm sure Essendon are pretty pleased that they just walk away from this game with four points. Well, that's it, guys. That's my thoughts on round four. Gave them my best crack. Flying out to America um, 24 hours from now. Um, so by the time you see this, I might just be heading to the airport. Hope everyone is well. I will have a Just the Tips out uh, tomorrow by the time you see this. And then I've got True Footy Podcast 99 coming out with Busher, all happening while I'm in the air. So hope you guys are doing well. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. And I'll see you on the other side, guys.